Shall we open our Bibles to Psalm 56? Psalm 56 and let's read verse 9. Psalm 56 verse 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Praise the Lord. This is the... These are the words of David. And he says, When I cry unto my God, my enemies will turn back. This I know. I am sure of this. Why? Because God is for me. Shall we all say just those last four words? God is for me. Confess it. Say it from your heart. God is for me. I don't know how many of you are able to say it, believing it. Some of you are thinking, well, I think God is for me. You have a doubt. You wonder, is, is God for me? Is, is God on my side? What's the doubt for? Why do you think God will be against you? Because you're bad? Just because you're bad, He's going to turn against you? You're very, very silly to think like that. Just because you're going through problems and you're having all kinds of problems at home, so you think now, maybe God is against me? You're making a big mistake. It is very hard for you to turn God against you. But it is something you must believe and be sure of. In every situation, it doesn't matter what is happening. What is your confession? What should your confession be? God is for me. God is for me. God is for me. Let that be your confession. David made this confession. But when did he make this confession? You look at the title of the psalm. When did he make that confession? Not when he was sitting in his, lying in his bed in his palace. It says, he wrote the psalm when the Philistines took him. He was captured by his enemies. The enemies came and caught hold of him. And now he is a prisoner to the Philistines. And when he is a prisoner, what is he saying? God is for me. Can you see the confession of this man of God? Today it doesn't matter what your situation is. But you must still say, my God is for me. It doesn't matter whether you're having a sickness in your body, or an ache or a pain or a problem, a situation. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if even if you have done something wrong, you can still say, my God is for me. It is because God is for you that He is convicting you. That He is showing you you are wrong. Because He is making a way for you. Because He is for you. That is a truth that we cannot deny and we should never ever doubt. As David had this firm assurance, we must also always have this firm assurance. God is for me. In every situation, in Psalm 118 verse 6, Psalm 118 verse 6, what does the psalmist say? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord is on my side. Why should I fear? What can man do unto me? Are you afraid of anyone? Are you afraid of a situation? Maybe you're afraid of what your boss is going to say tomorrow. You may be afraid of what your teacher is going to say tomorrow. We've all faced situations like that. I face situations like that too. What is my teacher going to say? What am, I go what, am, what am I going to do? We may have trembled. But understand one thing. If the Lord is on your side, you do not have to fear. Taking the words out of St. Paul, he says, what am I going to say? If God be for us, who can be against us? So this is the confession throughout the Bible. God is always for us. So please remember, even if you have grieved God, 
even if you have sinned against God, you may make him sad, you may break his heart, but you cannot make him hate you. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, you can be sure of this truth. He loves you. And that is one truth the devil does not want you to know. And that is why he will sow seeds of doubt in your head about the character of God. And you will start wondering, does God really love me? Does God really care for me? If God loved me, then why am I in this situation? And you start doubting God. That doubt comes from the devil. So this morning, let us just be sure of one thing. My God is for me. My God is for me. He is our father and we are his children. And we can rejoice in our God, rejoice in his protection, rejoice in his love. Today he is our redeemer and he is for us. Therefore shall we praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you Lord, thank you Lord, thank you Lord. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Today, I want to speak about a, one particular enemy. I'm going to speak to you about this enemy who really loves you. And that enemy is God. And you'll think, what a heresy. What blasphemy. Well, you can conclude at the end of my sermon. Because... We may confess, yes, my God is for me. But in reality, when we go through certain paths, we start wondering, is my God really for me? There are times when God seems to be against us. Is there any one person who can be honest enough to confess I have thought my God is against me. Can you put up your hand? There are many hands here that have been honest. You can put your hands down. So we have thought when things have gone against us, things go against us, we wonder. But you may think it's a bad feeling or wrong feeling. I'm going to show you in the Bible. Some of you may know this verse. Some of you may not have known this verse. You read Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2, you read verse 5. The Lord was as an enemy. Did you hear that? The Lord was as an enemy. He had swallowed up Israel. He had swallowed up Israel. He had swallowed up all her palaces. He had swallowed up all her palaces. Enough. The Lord was as an enemy. This is a book called Lamentation. Lamentation means weeping. It is written by a child of God who is going through a very bitter path. And he's weeping. How does he introduce himself in verse chapter 3 verse 1? Chapter 3 verse 1. Some believers may not understand this. Maybe you've had it all well. You've, you've had a cozy life. You've never been through pain. Some believers have never suffered. You don't know what pain or bitter parts you don't know what suffering is i remember there was one believer who came up to a servant of god a sister who came to the servant of god where i was working and said sister what is the meaning of suffering that's the first time i saw the the jaw of the servant of god drop pa you don't know what suffering is no sister i don't know what suffering is there are people who don't know what suffering is but what does this man say I am the man that hath been affliction, that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. I have seen affliction. And the next verse he said, He hath led me. Who is that? God. He hath led me, but he brought me into darkness, not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old, he hath broken my bones. Verse 6, He hath set me in dark places, as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about, that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. 
Also when I cry and shout, he shouted out my prayer. And he goes on and on and on. In verse 18 he said, And I said, My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord, remembering my affliction, my misery, the wormwood and the gall. He goes on and on and on. Then somehow in verse 21 he applies the brakes and he says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. And then he says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. You can see the pain and the suffering and the confusion. I have seen people question God. And even I have in my own life as a young boy, as I was getting to know God, there were times where God shut himself, he locked himself up and he wouldn't talk to me, he wouldn't comfort me, he wouldn't answer my prayers. And, and I felt my God was against me. If God is for us, then why does he seem to be against us at times? Why is it that everything seems to go wrong? We pray, but he does not answer us. We trust in him, but he does not help us. We seek him with all our heart, but we cannot find him. We knock, it doesn't open. We ask, and he doesn't give. We seek his will, but he doesn't seem to bother. He doesn't seem to care. If you're in such a situation, well, there can be a time, maybe God is taking you through a very dark path and you must trust in Him. But there are some people, when they go through a path like this, then you must do one thing. It's time for you to sit down and check up what is happening. What is happening? Why is my God like an enemy to me? There is one truth about God we must know. Our God is like a mirror. What you see in God is a reflection of yourself. Let me show you from a few verses how your God is a mirror. I have, I've, I've quoted this before, James chapter 4 verse 8. James chapter 4 verse 8 where God is a mirror. What do we read there? Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Now that's exactly what happens when you stand before a mirror. You get close to a mirror and what does the reflection do? It gets close to you. You go away from the mirror and the reflection goes away from you. God is behaving like you're standing in front of a mirror. You draw near him and he will draw near to you. The converse is true. Meaning, you go away from him and he will appear to go away from you. You read 2 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 2. 2 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 2. And he went out to meet Azar and said unto him, Hear ye me, Azar, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him. The Lord is with you, when you are with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. Okay. But if ye forsake him, if he you will forsake him, he will forsake you. He will forsake you. So what is what are these words telling us? Even King David, when he was handing over the throne to his son, and he was telling him that he has to sit on the throne and lead the people. David said this, My son, you must know the God of your father. You must know one thing. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. So, we must understand that our relationship with God has this one condition, that our God is a mirror to us. It's not that he is choosing to forsake us. It's not that he wants to forsake us. It's not that he wants to hurt us. But whatever we do to him will rebound to us. 
God is compared to the sun. Now, how many of you have seen the sun? What does it do in the morning? It shines, okay. It rises in the morning. It sets in the evening. Where does it rise? In which direction does it rise? It rises in the east. It sets in the west. And you've seen the sun go all over and set that side. Am I right? No, I'm wrong. Because the sun doesn't move. What is moving? The earth is rotating. It's because of the rotation of the earth, the sun appears to move. And we think, okay, the sun is moving. The sun is moving. But the sun is not moving. The sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The sun remains as it is. We are moving. But because we are moving, the sun appears to move. And what happens? The sun sinks into the west. And we watch it sink. And then we watch the whole earth plunged into darkness. How we are thinking the sun went down. And now I am in darkness. But really what happened? The sun never went down. I went this way. So whatever is happening to the earth is reflected in the sun. We can blame the sun for not shining through the night, but the sun never failed us. We have changed. What we see in God is a reflection of who we are. We view God. So today, who is your God? Whatever you see him, don't lie though. Some people, they, they lie. You're all the time lying about my God. You say, Lord, I love you. And he says, liar. You don't. You know you don't. Lord, I will follow you. You say, forget it. You say it here and you go out and you just do the opposite. Lord, I will serve you. What nonsense. You serve me. Lord, I will take up my cross. All through the week, you're nailing someone else. And you come here and say, Lord, I will take up my cross and follow you. Why don't you say the truth? Lord, I will pick up my hammer and the nails. We make these statements, but think carefully. What do you see in your God? What you see in Him is a reflection of who you are. Let's try and understand it from this parable in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Matthew 25 we know of that uh, famous parable of the talents that were given to the three servants. You read verse 15. And uh, well, well, read 14 and 15. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. He did the same thing with all the three men. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, to the third man he gave one talent. He never favored anyone or he never rebuked anyone. He just gave it according to how much they can trade with that. And then he went on his journey. The first two men, what did they do? They used the talents given to them and they went and they earned twice the amount and they kept it ready to give it to the master when he returns but we know what the last man did what did the last man do when it was his time to he he you read now in verse 24 well first of all you can uh, you read verse 18 but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. You can see what this man has done. He took the money that he had and he went and hid it in the ground. And he also waited. All three are waiting. At the end of the man, the man comes back. The three men produce. Tell me, how much does the first man produce? How much does the second man produce? Ten and four. And what does the last man produce? One. At the end of the story, how much does the first man have? Ten. Eleven. All right, you know the story. But this is what I want you to know. The first two men, they did what they had to do. 
But the last man did something so much the opposite. He hid his talent. And why did he do it? You read verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not stewed. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying, Master, I hid my talent because you are a hard man. And you are a hard man. And what are you doing? What are you doing? You are hiding. The, the, the master and the servant are having a very deep conversation. Master, I hid my talent because you are a hard man. And this is what you do. He says, you are going to reap where you haven't strawed. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, you are trying to reap or you are trying to gain something where you didn't even give the straw. Who is the master who did that? The Egyptian taskmasters. What did they do? They refused to provide the straw, but they told the Israelites, you have to make the bricks. You have to make the bricks, but we won't even give you the straw. That's a cruel taskmaster. And here, this man is saying, you are a hard man. You are a man. You won't give me the straw, but you'll ask me to make the bricks. I know you're a person like that. How often we look to the Lord and say, Lord, you don't give me the grace, but you're expecting something from me. You don't give me the strength, but you're asking me to do it. You don't give me the talent or the skill or the ability or the anointing, but you're making me do it. How many times we grumble? How many times we complain? We say, Lord, you are asking me to do something when you did not give me what I need for it. We accuse God. This man is accusing the master. But why did he have such a bad revelation of his master? Whereas the first two servants did not have it. The reason was because of his own character. What do we know about his character? Here we read further down in verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sown, sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. See, he is a wicked and a slothful. What does slothful mean? Lazy. You are a wicked and a lazy servant. You can see here, this man is a lazy man and he is a wicked man. Because of his own wickedness and his own laziness, he is now looking at God and saying, God is, his master is a hard person, his master is a cruel person. This is what we must understand. The psalmist says, with the pure, God will show himself pure. But with the froward, he will show himself froward. So, sinners, rebellious people, when they look at God, they say he's a hard God, he's a cruel God. This, this happens in the house too. It happens in the house. Some children will think, my, I don't like my parents because they are very hard. But why are the parents hard? They will not understand. They are very hard because you are very hard. How many parents agree to that? How many parents take pleasure in beating your children? Unless, unless I beat my daughter, my day is not complete. I have to beat someone in the house. That's not what your parents are like. But we feel my parent is hard. The reason the parent is hard is because we are hard. But we don't see that hardness in us, instead we look at the hardness in God. This happened right with the very first man. Adam, Adam, where are you? asked the Lord. And what is Adam doing like this last servant? The last servant hid the talent here, Adam hid himself. He's hiding behind a tree. And God asked Adam, for goodness sake, Adam, my friend, my beloved Adam, why are you hiding from me, Adam? Why? What was the answer of Adam? 
He said, Lord, I was afraid. You read that verse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Genesis 3, 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Lord, I heard your voice, and I became afraid. What happened to God? Did he become a bear? Did God suddenly turn into a monster? Did he say, Adam? And Adam heard his voice and went and hid himself. Adam never knew what fear is. There was no fear in the garden. There was not this word afraid never occurred before. Such an emotion was unknown until that point. But now he says, Lord, I heard your voice and I was afraid. Why? Because of his own sin. Adam sinned and now he's afraid of God. When we are guilty, we want to avoid God. So at such times what happens, we look at God and God appears to be an enemy. Is there anyone here who is struggling with your God? You're not able to love him because he's not a lovable person. He's a very hard person. He's very cruel to me. He makes so many demands on me. He's always beating me. He's always forcing me. I'm now suffering the blows of the Almighty. I, I just feel God is so cruel. He's partial to others. He's always blessing the others. But he's always, he's singling me out for adversity. I'm always being the one being beaten. And the other one is always being blessed. Look at that sister. Oh, she's always blessed. She's always favored. And look at me. No matter how much I try, I end up messing up. And why does God permit this? Oh, this God is like an enemy. I want you for a moment to think about it. God is for you. God is on your side. But if you think God is an enemy, remember, He is a mirror. And there is something you need to understand about yourself in the way God is leading you. And I want you to understand that we struggle with Him. We struggle with God. One reason we struggle with Him is because we are not able to align ourselves with His will. We do not want to do His will. That is the area where many believers struggle. The will of God. They have their own will. And God reveals His will. And they want God to adjust His will and come and suit them. But will God ever adjust His will? He never will compromise on His will because His will for you is perfect. He will never alter it. His perfect will can never be altered. So some of our greatest battles, some of our greatest battles are not with the devil and with the self and with the world. Yes, we have great battles. But practically, some of the battles we fight are with God. Some of the struggles we face are with God. Let me give you an example. Suppose the Lord is trying to convict you of a particular sin. What do we naturally do? Our natural defenses are up. The moment you are convicted, someone tells you, you did this wrong. What is the first thing you do? The first thing you do is, no, it's not like that. I'm sorry, no. Self-justification is the defense mechanism that we are born with. And we foster it, and we build it up, and we grow with it, and we love it. The moment someone touches us, or says, you know, what you did was not right. We don't like it. Anyone like that? I am like that. That is a fallen human nature. It is wrong. It is wrong. We want to always act that, you know, I'm correct. You, the person who's correcting me is wrong. And I am correct. Of course, maybe a few days later we'll think about it and say, well, I think maybe I'm wrong. It all raises like that. But why does it have to take a few days? So we find that when God is trying to convict us, we 
defend ourselves. So how does God do it? He doesn't come and stand before us. You open the Bible and there a verse jumps out and stabs you in the heart. And what do you do? How many of you have closed the Bible saying, Oh, I don't want to read it because it's hurting me. I remember once I was listening to a CD. And the, the words were like, Oof, they, were not, they were not like little bullets. They're like laser beams piercing through my skull. And I had to just, oh, I had to shut it. I had to shut it. I said, I can't listen to it. I don't want to listen to it. It was too, too painful. Too painful. Thank God it was a CD. What if you're sitting in a meeting and the pastor is preaching? How do you switch him off? Go to the toilet. And come after the meeting. It was a CD and I was able to switch it off. I, I shut the pastor and I stopped him from speaking, from preaching. I don't want to hear, it's too painful. Conviction is too painful. So you, you see, God uses someone to convict you. Or maybe a sermon, maybe a person, maybe it's your own child. So what do you do? You shut out that conviction. No, I don't accept it. You go somewhere to your workplace, there the Lord uses someone. Every corner you turn, you find God standing there. You see Lamentation 3 says, God is like a bear waiting for me in the corner. Everywhere I turn, He is there waiting for me. What is He trying to do? Can't you leave me alone? Just let me live my life. Why are you tormenting me like this? My God is like an enemy. He's tormenting me. Every corner I see, He is there. Waiting to point my fault. Waiting. I remember once when God was playing chess with me. It doesn't happen like that, I know. But I'm just saying, life is like that, isn't it? He makes a move, I make a move. He tries to trap me, I wriggle out. I turn this way, I turn this way. And one day, he suddenly moved and said, Checkmate. How do I wriggle out of this? I was trapped. And that is what God seems to be doing. He is trying to push us into a corner. So, when He pushes us into that corner, he obviously, God Himself doesn't do it. He uses a lot of people. And we look at all those people whom He used. And what do we look at them and say? I love you. Huh? Is that what you would say? I love you all for pushing me into this corner. We look at every one of them as our enemies. Every one that the Lord has used, we look at them as an enemy. Look at King Ahab. King Ahab was a king. Once upon a time, he was Elijah's friend. They spoke well, did everything well. But now, King Ahab began to backslide. Little by little, things went wrong in King Ahab's life. And suddenly, he looked at Elijah and said, Oh, mine enemy. Did Elijah turn against him? No, he did not. Ahab backslid. When Ahab backslid, he looked at Elijah and said, Elijah is an enemy. Dear believer, please understand one thing. If you fight against God, and if you fight against the will of God, then God will appear to fight against you. Is God really fighting against you? No, He is not. He's just like the sun and the earth. It appears that God is fighting against you. It appears that He's turning people against you. But remember, He is not fighting against you. You are fighting against Him. You are angry with Him. You are rebelling against Him. So, in your battles with God, let me tell you a secret. A very precious secret. In our battles with God, the secret of victory is to lose. The secret of victory is to lose such battles and allow God to win. That is how we can also win this battle. The secret of victory is to allow God to corner us, to conquer us, to defeat us, and to take the fight out of us. When God pushes you into that corner and defeats you, that is when you will win. How do you win the battle against God? You win the battle 
by losing. That is a wisdom that only experience can make us understand. Those of you who have never fought this battle with God, to you, I am speaking some strange gobbledygook. You don't understand this language. But those of you who have fought with God, I have fought with God. I have struggled with God. I've got angry with God. When he didn't, oh, those paths that he took me through to, to, to deflate me and to smash me up. Oh, those paths were not very easy. They were very painful. Once I flung a pillow at him. I said, I don't like you. I hate you. But then I had to come back to him and said, I'm sorry. Where do I go? If I go away from you, where do I go? I realized I was fighting with him. And the whole problem was me. I was fighting. I was running away from the will of God. Look at Jacob. He was running and running and running for more than 30 years. He was running. He was running. He was a very cunning crook. He was a clever fellow. And he knew how to escape. Like some believers, they are very cunning crooks. They know the right things to do, the right words to say. They know how to escape situations. Well, others are fools, you know, they just fall and they get trapped. But they know exactly how to wriggle out of these difficult situations. They are clever people. And as long as you are clever and as long as you are deceitful and you are cunning, you speak all these double things and you know how to adjust, you're a fool. Because you are running and running. And how long are you going to run? Jacob ran and ran for more than 30 years. But when did Jacob win? It was when he was cornered and when he gave up. And that is the day he prevailed and he won. So when we... When we are struggling like this with God, we must stop and think, what am I doing? The fact is when we do not want to do the will of God, then we start our battle with Him. We start our struggle with Him. And what we will do is, we will run away from God. A young man came to Jesus. He was so happy when he came to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I want an improvement in my spiritual life. Jesus, I want to grow. I want this and I want that. He was so happy when he came to Jesus. Two minutes later, he turned away from Jesus very unhappy. Why? Because Jesus told him, this is the will of God concerning you. And he was very unhappy. He couldn't accept it. And he turned away sorrowful. So many people, when the will of God is placed before them, they cannot accept it. Immediately their life becomes miserable. And oh, how pathetic, how tragic. We can just look at that in the example of our famous little prophet, Prophet Jonah. And if you look at the episode of Jonah, you'll see he's a real example to us in our fallenness. And you can see how Jonah did something very, very wrong. If you turn to the book of prophet Jonah, God clearly revealed his will to him. Jonah, this is my will for you. You must go to the place called Nineveh and you must go and preach against it. Because that city is wicked. They have done so much evil, they are sinful, go and preach against it. But Jonah did not want to go. He did not want to go to Nineveh. So what did he do? You read now Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. He rose up to flee unto Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord. Uh -huh. You see that? Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. But flee from the presence of the Lord. He's running away from God. Why? Because God revealed His will to him. He's running away from God. Why would you run away from God? Why would a prophet run away from God? Because God has revealed His will to him. And? And went down to Joppa. He went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. Alright, we'll stop there. There's so much we can understand there. Nineveh was in the east. Now, Tarshish was exactly in the opposite direction. 
God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. But what does he do? He doesn't just go to a, a little outside Nineveh. He goes right in the opposite direction. He wanted to go exactly in the opposite direction of God's will. And it's so sad. There are believers in that state. God reveals His will to you. It may be concerning your life. It may be concerning your future. It may be concerning your family. God reveals and you have a will. You have a plan. God says, this is my will for you. And you go right in the opposite direction. That's what now Jonah wants. Lord, you want Nineveh for me, but I want Tarshish. Because it's exactly in the opposite direction. Now that is what he wanted. Now why did he go to Joppa? Joppa was a seaport. It was a little harbor. And what would you find in a little harbor? You find ships or boats in a harbor. Now can you see this? Listen carefully and understand. Jonah wants to flee from God. He wants to run away from God. He does not want to go to Nineveh. He does not want the will of God. Nineveh is the will of God. He doesn't want that. He wants to go to Tarshish, right in the opposite direction. What does he do? He goes to Joppa. Now Joppa is another place altogether. It's a harbor. And in Joppa, he finds a ship. Where's the ship going? How is that? He finds a ship there and where's the ship going? It's going to Tarshish and so many people they fall at this point. You know what they do? They say, ah, well, I prayed, I went to Joppa and there standing there was a ship for me. And do you know where it was going? It's going to Tarshish. Then I knew that is the will of God. It is the will of God for me to go to Tarshish. Why? Because the ship was parked and waiting there. And when I went there, the man took his hat and waved at me also. Poor man, he must have been feeling very hot. He must have been fanning himself. You thought he's waving and saying, come, come, come. You took it. You fell for it. You walked right into the trap. Many people, this is how they find the will of God. How, is, how do they find the will of God? They have a plan already. They have a plan. This is what I want. Then, every time God says Nineveh, they'll turn the other way, they pretend they didn't hear. Surely that's not for me, it must be from the other, you know, the other person there. They wait and wait and wait and wait. Somewhere, someone sneezes. Ashish, ah, Tashish. Ah, I heard it. I heard. They're just waiting for some sign somewhere. Immediately they say, ah, that is the will of God. That is the will of God. I knew. You are looking for a ship and you will find it. What's the saying in English? Where there is a will, there is a way. Add to it. Where there is a self-will, you will also find a way. And because you are a child of God, you know at the end of the day, even if you have done your self-will, at the end of the day, you have got one friend who will never spare you and it's called your conscience. He will be bothering you. So you found a little trick. You want to do your self-will, same time you want to convince yourself that is the will of God. So how do you do? You go to Joppa and you will find a ship there saying, Ship to Tarshish, almost full, only one vacancy left and it is for a person whose name starts with J. You think this is really the hand of God, this is really the will of God and you'll jump in. That is what Jonah did. Please believers, you must know how to discern the will of God. As we heard this morning in the Bible study, we may see dreams, but not all our dreams are from God. We have to have a guidance with the word of God. The word of God is that rock, that solid rock that guides us. It is the lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. But Jonah was determined. He wanted to run away from God. Is it really possible? He says, I took, he wants to take a ship to flee from the presence of God. What does the psalmist say? Where can I flee from the presence of God? In Psalm 139, verse 7, he says, 
Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? I'm trying to ascend. If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. And in verse 5 he says, You have beset me behind and before, and your hand is upon me. You are trying to run away from God. Do you think there's a hiding place from God? If you try to run away from God, how far can you go? How far can you go? Do you know the farthest place a person can run away from God? If you run away, your father and father and father and father and father and father and father. Is there a place like that? The Bible makes us understand God is omnipresent. Meaning, He is everywhere. No matter where you go, you can go to outer space and perch yourself on a comet. And the Lord will say, hi, I was waiting for you. You cannot run away from Him. But still, there are some people who try their best to run away from God. They run and they run and they run and they run. Do you know where they end up? That place is called hell. What is hell? Hell is the place where people who have run away from God all their lives end up. Hell is the place where there is no God. They wanted it like that. I don't want God to control my life. I don't want God to decide where I should go. I don't want God to decide what I should eat. I don't want God to decide these things. This is my life and I want to live my life. And they run and run and run and run and run. God never casts people into hell. They choose it. It's like, it's like traffic signals. You go and park your car at the traffic light. When it turns green, you go forward. Do you blame the tra traffic signal now? Because of you, I went forward. No. Who asked you to go and stop there? God only lifts his hand and the people fall into hell. Because they chose it. It's their choice. Now look at Jonah. He's running, 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 running from God. And you will see in this little book of four chapters, Jonah in the end, he confesses. I am in hell. A prophet of God making that confession. But let's just look at it. What happened when Jonah fled from God? And when Jonah fled from the will of God? Everything turned against him. Everything went against him. Even nature. Even nature went against him. You read now verse 4. Chapter 1 verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. A wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Here was Jonah filling up that last vacancy in the ship. He found a Joppa and he's on his way to Tashish and he's sailing in the comfort of those waters. And he's thinking, what a lovely day. Whew, that was a close call. Probably if he goes down to Tarshish, he'll find a little church there and he'll go up and testify and say, I am Jonah, I'm a man of God, I'm a prophet of God and I want to tell you how the Lord kept me. He brought me safely all the way and he wants to make me a testimony. The poor pastor there, he doesn't know left from right and he says, oh God brought you at the right time. Come and be our preacher today, Jonah. And Jonah stands there and he preaches a wonderful sermon. There's a revival in Tarshish. Jonah thought he would do that. It didn't happen like that. On the way, something happened. The Lord sent a mighty wind and the sea turned rough and the waves started slapping into the ship and nature unleashed its fury, boisterous anger against the ship and it was about to break. Now Jonah was, what was he doing inside? Actually he was sleeping. The mariners in the ship, they were all really afraid. And what did they do? In the, that same verse, or well, the next verse it says, they did everything to lighten the ship. You know what they did? They, they threw out all the cargo, whatever, unnecessary things, and then all the necessary things. They threw out everything. They're hoping that by lightening the ship, everything can be all right. You know, some people, when they, there are storms in their life and... So many things going wrong. They will be throwing out all the wrong things. 
they will be putting right all the things they don't need to put right. But the real culprit is hiding downstairs. The real culprit is sleeping. You won't touch that culprit. The real thing you don't touch. The root of the problem, you leave that. You give all excuses, you give all reasons, but you know where the root of your problem is. Well, in the end, these mariners had no other choice. Even they had to turn against Jonah. And they said, Jonah, there's no choice we have. You have run away from your God and look at us, we are suffering. Now we're going to throw you out. And out went Jonah tossed into the sea. Now look at it, everything against him. Then what happened in chapter 1 verse 17? Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, now we know the story of Jonah being swallowed up by the fish. How many of you have been inside a fish? Stupid question. I don't expect to see hands, but obviously it wasn't like a five-star hotel. You can just imagine the, the slush all around him and, and the fish doesn't know good food from bad food and he, does, you know, he doesn't have any eating habits and all that would have been inside him and you can just imagine the yucky feeling and the smell and all that for three days. But I'll still tell you, that fish was the mercy of God. If the fish hadn't swallowed Jonah, the sea would have swallowed him and killed him. So the fish, Jonah would have been so unhappy for three days. And he would have been so angry. Oh, the stinky fish, how do I get out of my prison? Actually, it was inside the fish, he said, I feel like I'm in hell. You see chapter 2, verse 2, he doesn't say, well, 2, 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish belly. Mm, not bad, huh? He's still practicing his religion then. There, okay, carry on. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Out of the belly of hell cried I. He didn't say out of the belly of the fish. Out of the belly of hell. I feel like I'm in hell. Why? Why did you land inside a fish, Jonah, in the first place? I was running away from God. And he's now feeling God has thrown me into hell. The fish went against him. The sea went against him. The people went against him. The wind went against him. All nature's against him. It doesn't end there. You now read in the last chapter, chapter 4. And there you read a, a tiny creature called a worm went against him. In chapter 4 verse 7, a worm becomes Jonah's enemy. Have you noticed, if you're running away from God... Everything becomes a problem. The tiniest thing offends you. Everything upsets you. Everything is against you. Even the worm becomes against you. How did the worm turn against him? How could such a tiny creature become against Jonah? First you read verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6. You read there. And the Lord God prepared a God. He prepared this good for Jonah. He prepared it like a shelter, like a protection. And... Jonah was enjoying this. See, sometimes, even in our backslidden state, even when we have run away from God, God tosses a little biscuit for us. And what do we do? We nibble on that biscuit and we use it to forget God. So God pulls that biscuit out also. God gave a little good. Okay, Jonah, okay, you can rest a while. So Jonah became very cozy, resting in its shade. Then in verse 7, but God prepared a worm ah. when the morning rose the next day and it smote and the good. And it smote the good and it's it withered. And the next verse what happened? And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and, he, and wished in himself to die and said, It's better for me to die than to live. Enough! I have had enough. I want to die. I want to die. I've had enough. So many of you have made this confession. Enough. I have suffered enough. I've had enough. I want to die. I can't take it anymore. I want to die. Jonah want to die. Why? This is a mighty prophet. Now he can't face the battle against a worm. And the worm is now against me. This worm. <laughs> It's too much for me. It's not a python. It's not an anaconda. It's a little harmless worm, but I can't face this now. 
You go away from God, look what happens to you. Even the worm is a big enemy, you can't bear it. But what do you see common in all these natural situations? Tell me. In chapter 1 verse 4, what did we read? A wind came out of the sea? No. The Lord sent out a great wind. Okay? Chapter 1 verse 17. The Lord prepared a great fish. Chapter 4 verse 6. The Lord prepared a good. Chapter 4 verse 7. And God prepared a worm. I just wonder what that means. God prepared a worm. How did he do it? He set it out. Okay. Now he put it there. Right. He is taking so much trouble. And then in verse 7 or verse 8. And God prepared a vehement east wind. God prepared all these things with so much love. He prepared it. He prepared the whole thing. With so much love he's doing it. But what is Jonah saying? I've had enough. I want to die. Can you see the state of this man? When we are running away from God, when we are running away from the will of God, even the love that God shows, it will look like hatred for us. The kindness that He shows, it will look like enmity. Everything, we will look at everything the wrong way. We will misunderstand, we will misinterpret, we will be so offended. I remember there was a brother in that first assembly I worked. Okay, he's dead now, so... This brother was in that church. And... Uh, he couldn't talk to anybody in the church. He will always stand by himself and he had no friends. I thought, poor man, he's all alone. So I went up to talk to him. I said, praise Lord, brother. Praise the Lord. How are you? Fine. Are you alright? Yes, I'm fine. Is anything troubling you? No, I'm fine. What do I do next? I said, so shall I go? Yeah. So I said, when? I'm thinking, how do I make conversation? This guy is just giving mm and mm and just, just grunting and not making conversation. He's supposed to make conversation. So I tried a few times. Later I was, I understood that, I was understanding the psychology in the church. This brother felt, he was really a paranoid. He felt nobody likes me, everybody hates me and... So I thought, okay, now I'm going to take over this situation. I am the doctor here. I'm going to bring a healing in this situation. So I said, okay. I arranged for it. After a meeting, I told the believers, all of you must go one by one and speak to him. And they all tried and they all met this. Uh, yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, they all met the same thing and they couldn't communicate with him. So, he, of course, he had a daughter. And... Uh, one believer thought, one day he was ill, this man was ill. So, this poor believer thought, let me, at least let me break the ice by giving him some lovely soup. Made some nice soup, and went and gave it. And he stood at the door and said, why are you bringing the soup? Said, because I heard you're not well. No, it's not that. Because you want my daughter for your son. <sighs> she just dropped the soup and ran away. Can you see how the mind works? Every good act is now interpreted as evil. And I'll tell you the sad thing, he died like that. I was very sad. I did so much to help him. We were supposed to have a cottage meeting in a particular believer's house. I told that believer, I'm cancelling the meeting in your house. He said, why brother, what have I done? He said, you haven't done anything, but I'm still going to cancel it. I'm going to have it in this believer's house. So I called this believer and I said, we are all coming to your house, we are going to pray for your house, we are going to do this. He did not want it. He, everything that we did, he looked at it from the wrong angle. And he, it was so sad he did that and his daughter left the church also. But I am just telling you this, Jonah, God loved him. And God had a plan for him, a plan of love. But Jonah looked at everything that the Lord did as enmity, 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 hatred. And in the end, I want to die. It is better for me to die than to live. Dear children of God, 
You may not be in Jonah's pathetic state today, but you could very well be trekking certain paths that he went through. I want you to understand one thing. God is not your enemy. He is your friend. He, well, you are feeling he's your enemy. But I'll tell you, this enemy really loves you. He loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you. He is the enemy who loves you. If you can only understand how much he loves you, you will realize he's not your enemy. In fact, he's your closest friend. Do not struggle with him anymore. The best way to win the battle is by surrendering to him and say, All right, Lord, let your will be done. When you lose this battle with God, you will win the greatest battle of your life. Let us understand from the life of this troubled prophet, he wouldn't do the will of God. And there's so much more you can study, but I will just say that and finish. But let us not run away from God. Instead, let us always stand with God. And let us understand, our God is always for us. And therefore, we must always be for Him. We must always stand with Him. And we must always surrender to His will. God must really help all of us, especially those who are struggling in this matter. There are some believers who are struggling, running from God. Please don't run away from Him. You feel everything is against you. No, the Lord is for you. And the Lord is with you.